Thanks, everybody. Uh, Alan, thanks for, for doing this uh, session. Uh, I want to thank Paragon 28 for sponsoring this hour. Uh, but this Liz Frank injury section is all yours. Thanks, Alan. All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my friends, colleagues, and the fellow uh, foot and ankle trauma surgeons around the globe. It's actually, this is uh, another exciting event. Uh, thanks to the initiation of this global uh, event by Dr. Parekh and the uh, Parekh Family Foundation. So I'm Alan Yen from uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and uh, faculty of the University of South Dakota and North Dakota. So I'm the modulator of this session tonight, and uh, from, from Asia, it's uh, in the morning, and I will assist and lead the discussion after uh, our assembly of this outstanding panel. Uh, both uh, had tons of experiences in trauma and for the ankle. And uh, today our topic of uh, interest is Liz Frank, which is always the hot topic and many with many debates uh, in each uh, uh, conference system for the ankle and trauma. So so as we know, it's uh, the, the Liz Frank, we see it quite often in our clinic if you are for the ankle uh, and also if you're doing tons of trauma and the missing rate from the literature is from 25% uh, or even higher. So in the ED, and sometimes it was uh, uh, one of the papers as, uh, citing it as one of the most litig, uh, you know, uh, one of the most scenarios you can get at uh, litigations uh, in the United States. Uh, so uh, also there are many difficult situations. You're hard to make a diagnosis, and uh, there are new type of fixation coming out. Uh, uh, there, there are situations where we have distal and proximal uh, extensions of different patterns. Uh, some are obviously you see what it is and some are like uh, 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 a little bit harder to figure out. So uh, so we have our uh, outstanding panel tonight and uh, some of the thought leaders uh, uh, globally. And uh, let me introduce our panel to you tonight and uh, order our presentations. We'll be in a form of uh, case presentation and then we leave our time for discussion and then I'll look at the uh, 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 question and answer session. So our first presenter will be uh, Dr. Steinloff. Uh, uh, Steve is uh, for the ankle, uh, chief of for the ankle at University of Miami. And uh, he is one of my go-to buddies and mentors for a long time. You know, when I have uh, difficult cases, I just uh, bugging him. <laughs> I just ask him my pleasure. Two cases this week, actually. All right. And uh, then follow up with Steve. And Steve was trained at uh, uh, FOI as one of uh, the uh, most heavy foot and ankle trauma and also, also other type of trauma with uh, Roy Sanders over there. And uh, our next presenter uh, it will be uh, Dr. Chone from uh, 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 from uh, from Singapore. Just look at the, his, uh, 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 you know, brief intro. He is the past chair of Ortho Foot and Ankle Society in Singapore and also past chair of AO Trauma Singapore. So uh, his case, this is going to be like very inclusive and, uh, you, you know, we will learn uh, tons from them. And then we have Dr. Zhong Ming. Uh, Dr. Shu is from Shanghai. If we think our life is busy, you know, how many patients we see, it will probably going to times 10 times in uh, his hospital. I've seen the volume that they see and uh, it's it's just amazing. And, uh, and, and finally, it's my buddy, Dr. Uh, Yoon, uh, Patrick Yoon is from Minnesota, uh, Hennepin uh, County, and that's one of the busiest trauma center in the United States. And I learned a tons of that from uh, Dr. Yoon. He's one of uh, the, uh, you know, the best, one of the best foot and ankle uh, trauma uh, surgeons uh, in the United States. Okay, without further ado, we have Steve uh, lead uh, the first presentation uh, in uh, Liz Frank Injuries. Steve, you can uh, take over. Thank you, Alan. Um, so, you know, it's very interesting. I've been doing this for 23 years now, and early in my career, we had this propensity to take any questionable Liz Frank injury to the operating room for a stress image very early uh, in order to operate if we needed to, to prevent arthritis. And I think our whole paradox and paradigm has shifted, especially after uh, an article came out, you know, mid 2000s, looking at primary fusion versus ORIF of Liz Frank injuries. And uh, that was a um, Kosea study and it showed that primary fusions probably did better. And so I went through this decision process of, well, you know what, if I, I'm going to fuse someone at one week or three weeks or, or six months, does it really matter how quickly 
I make the diagnosis of whether they're stable or not. And I will quite often wait for a period of time until they can put all their weight on their foot and get a good weight bearing x-ray in my office. And if need be, I'll get a bilateral weight bearing x-ray. And so very little impetus to, to bring someone to the operating room. And so we get cases every once in a while, like when I'm going to present that will pose a little bit of a, a challenge. And so here's a case. This is a 20 year old collegiate football player for a university. And if anyone takes care of sports teams, they know people want answers immediately. They want to know when can they get their running back or their, their defensive back on the field so that they can play in the next game. And it pressures even harder when you're talking about professional athletes. And so he was at practice, he's a fullback and he's running and he feels a pop in his foot and he has some pain, but he's able to walk on it to a good extent. Comes into the office, physical exam, he has no plantar ecchymosis, he has some swelling of the foot and he has some pain, but he's a 260 pound, very solid muscular guy and I can examine him and all he does is grimaces a little bit and he says he's okay and he wants to play. Okay. It's like reverse workers comp. All they want to do is get on the field. They don't want to sit down. So these are his full weight bearing x-rays. And when I said to him, I go, are you putting all of your weight down? He says, yes, I'm putting all my weight down. I look at the x-rays and I honestly don't see any difference. You know, anyone on the panel see any difference between one foot or the other? All right. So I said, listen, you felt a pop. Yes, I felt a pop doctor. Mm, let me stress you in the x-ray room. And let's see if there's anything there. But how do you really stress a midfoot? I can't give him an ankle block in the clinic. He's a big, strong guy. I said, you know what? I can stress him. So we take him. We do stress x-rays in the office. Normal side, painful side. Anyone on the panel see a difference there? See a little bit of a difference, maybe, right? I think so, too. He says, Doc, I'm fine. Let me play. I want to play this week. I said, I don't know. I think there's a difference there. I think there's a very slight difference. Maybe you have a list Frank tear. Let me take you to the operating room. Doc, I don't want to go under anesthesia. I said, yes, true. But if you have an injury and you pivot on this once, you may take a partial injury and make it worse. I want to take you to the operating room. So you know what? We go to the operating room. This is interoperative stress x-rays. What do you guys see? Pretty unstable, right? Yep. It looks like all, at least one, two, and three are unstable. And I think it's eye-opening. I stressed this guy as hard as I could in the office. He's, again, a very muscular individual. Even those little foot intrinsic are, are muscular. And I couldn't get them to budge. I'm glad I went with my instinct. All right, what do we do now? This is for the panel. This is a 20-year-old collegiate athlete. I just said we have studies that show you may do much better with primary fusions. Who wants to fuse them on the panel? We got no takers. Who wants to fix them? All right. Who wants to fix them with transarticular screws? What other ways can we fix them? Anyone want to do bridge plating, maybe? Any other options? All right. I will show you what we did. So went ahead. That's a whole lot of metal, but I didn't violate any of his joints. And so I think bridge plating in these high level athletes is reasonable. 90% of the patients I see are not high level athletes. I'm doing more primary fusions at one, two, and three. I think that gives me a very good long-term outcome with very low risk for needing to do any other surgery. And so when would you remove the bridge plates? Anyone have a time frame? Three months? Anyone for three months? Three months. Okay. Four months. Five months. Six months. <coughs> All right. I got a couple for six months. I got one. Yeah, he's, he's waving for six months. And that I think is about the right time. You know, it's interesting. I'll get isolated Liz Frank's injuries at the second TMT. What I've been doing there is I'll, I'll do basically a home run screw and a bridge plate, and then I'll come back at three months and I'll take both out, but I'm putting flexible fixation in for those as a backstop. I don't 
think that's a bad thing to do. And I've gotten lucky on those. They've No one has become unstable, but I think it lets me rehab them a little sooner. This guy, I did not let run and jump at three months or even at four months. I was afraid I was going to have broken plates everywhere and it'd be harder to take out. So I took him slower, but more significant injury than simply an isolated list, Frank. Okay. Next technique tip. On the panel, how many people use two incisions if you have involvement of tarsal metatarsal joints one, two, three, and maybe four? Okay. I'm going to show you something I stumbled upon that seemed to help me. So we know two incision approach has been standard. You need to maintain a good skin bridge. We need to be biologically friendly. You don't want to undermine your flaps. And for the average healthy person, this is an old case. This is 20 some years ago. He had a compartment syndrome. We did transarticular screws back then, fixed him alone. He did fine. He did real well long-term. But what happens in someone who has bad soft tissue, a Tichern level three, a horrible crush injury, you know, someone who has heart disease or on an anticoagulant, you're worried about bleeding into the wounds, medical comorbidities, diabetes. Is there a better alternative? Because here's some guy that had trauma and his skin was pretty good, but he was on Xeralto, which is a blood thinner for AFib. And sure enough, he developed a horrible hematoma, horrible infection. This was a nightmare of mine for probably a year. So what I've started doing is I look at these differently. Here's a bad list, Frank. You know, you can see all five joints are involved. But what I've been able to do is go ahead and I map out one incision. The incision you can see is basically right between one and two. And I have my dorsalis pedis uh, artery and my deep perineal nerve off to one side, EHLs off to the other. And I use a pin spreader. The pin spreader allows me to first get into one and two. Once I'm done with those, I put the pins into three and I can basically do my debridement through the one incision. And I put a little freer elevator there so that my resident doesn't track his uh, elevator into the fourth TMT and give me cartilage damage there. But it allows me to prep the third TMT very nicely. And I can do it through the one incision. And then what we do is we get our fixation basically with a cannulated screw through a very small incision more distally. And then for the fifth, I do a closed reduction. I can hold it with a pin and again, put another position screw. And what it looks like basically is this. You have one small incision right here. And you have one small incision here. I've been doing this now for probably about five years, six years, and it works well. And so I've gone away from that two incision unless I have a fourth and fifth TMT that I simply can't reduce. If I can't reduce them with closed techniques, then I open them. I do two incisions. But the other beauty of it is quite often that fifth TMT will reduce when we reduce one, two, and three. We have that lateral list frank ligament that we didn't know existed until someone did an anatomic study a couple of years ago, but it goes from the base of two to the base of five. And so when you reduce one, two, and three, four and five will often follow. And if they're stable, I don't even put fixation there. So probably in half of my cases now, I do one incision. And I think simply a nice way of being able to reduce risk. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. This is an awesome presentation. So uh, we're just going to continue uh, with our uh, uh, second presentation. I think uh, is uh, Dr. Chong. Yeah. Dr. Chong is on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening. Good night to everyone. It's actually morning here in Asia. So I have a couple of cases, uh, quite simple one, and the rationale for me choosing uh, these two cases is uh, mainly because they involve the lateral column injuries, which are slightly less common, uh, commonly seen. So we can talk a little bit about uh, um, this plan with lateral column injury. And also, uh, I personally find, and I totally agree with uh, uh, Steve earlier, uh, that that a lot of these subtle instabilities are very difficult to manage and they're often missed. And um, the, the real problem in this plan is not the ones that come in horribly dislocated, uh, nor the ones that are um, just uh, isolated second metatarsal uniform instability. The real problems are the ones which are in between when you when you where slightly more than more than that isolated 
second PMP drain instability, but not as bad as the grossly dislocated ones with crash injuries and all that. These, these are the big problems. So uh, my, my two cases are kind of like these types. So, so this is a 32-year-old uh, male with an acute injury. Uh, he was um, a construction worker that was uh, that fell from from maybe about two to three meters, landed on the forefoot, and these were the, the X-rays seen at the emergency room, and the ER physician actually sent him back. Um, with a, with a back slap, with a splint, with crutches, and was treating it as just a foot confusion uh, because the x-rays seemed normal. But he had persistent swelling, a lot of pain, and uh, eventually I got to see him. And if you look carefully at the x-rays, uh, it, it's quite misleading. I don't blame the ER physician because they don't look at the foot that well, but if you look very carefully, there seem to be some irregularities at one, two, three seems to be fine. If you look over here, uh, uh, if, you, if, if you can get a, a better view of it, I think the images might be a little small on the screen. Uh, the, usually on the oblique film, you can see right through the fourth and fifth uh, metatarsal cuboid joint, but here you can see that it is, there's some overlap. You, don't, you can't see right through that joint. Uh, over here, it's just a little bit strange and unusual. So I decided to, uh, the x-rays seem innocuous, but a bit suspicious, foot is very swollen, perfusion is fine. Uh, the me mechanism of injury was a, an axial loading on the forefoot. So again, we look at it a little bit more closely. This is not visible that fourth and fifth metatarsal cuboid joint is not visible clearly and there seems to be just something that's not right going on here so what next so i got him a ct scan and it showed a fourth and fifth uh, dislocation okay from the cuboid and uh, the third metatarsal base had some comminuted fracture uh, which is not seen here and uh, so I think the mechanism of injury in this case is an axial loading on the lateral column of the foot where the fourth and fifth pop dorsally like the piano key and the third has a base fracture which is an axial loading type of fracture. Uh, the medial columns were uninvolved at all, completely uninvolved which is uh, a little bit uncommon for this spring injury. So intraoperatively, I can see that there is a completely empty uh, metatarsal cuboid joint. I made an incision over the, the, the line of the fourth metatarsal, so I could get to the three, and I could get to four and five, and the joint was completely empty. So it was uh, it's completely dislocated, and uh, it wasn't a very difficult operation because it just needed four and five to be popped back into place. Uh, three base was plated across the joint because it was comminuted, so I just needed something to get the uh, metatarsal out to length uh, and let the uh, uh, ligamental plexus do its job. So eventually, this was the final fixation. Three was plated across the joint. Four and five was stabilized with just a pin after the reduction. So this, uh, I brought up this case mainly to, to uh, illustrate uh, the fact that uh, there are some unusual mechanism of injuries in this bank and I, I do think that this was an axial loading on the lateral column over the, uh, from the forefoot and uh, basically 3.5 uh, four and five popped up dorsally like a like a pop pop out like a piano key and three had a base fracture. So my next case is an uh, 18 year old male, uh, very big guy, 
very, very obese, was running and his foot stepped into a shallow hole and the rest of the body kept moving forward. Uh, a fairly typical uh, Liz Frank mechanism of injury. These were his uh, x-rays at the emergency room uh, where these were non-weight bearing x-rays. It was in quite a fair bit of pain, but uh, one could see a slight widening of the scab uh, on the AC view. So there was some um, immediate suspicion of a Liz Frank injury. Now these are the types that I was talking about where they are not the one, two, three, four, five, frankly dislocated, horrible looking. These are the ones that seemingly appear to be uh, an isolated injury, but one can't be sure. So clinically, uh, clinically, if you examine him, he would have a lot of pain over the mid foot. It's very swollen, a lot of bruising. Uh, and therefore, I decided that we needed further imaging. And uh, that was what I got next, which is the CT scan. So on the CT scan, one could see that one, there might be a bit of a scat between uh, uh, C1 and M2, but one base, three base, seems all right. But on the lateral column, one could see a fracture involving the cuboid. So this, to me, seemed like a variant of the nutcracker type of injury, except that it occurred at a different joint. Uh, instead of the calcaneal cuboid joint, it, was, it occurred a little bit more distantly. So, the interesting thing about this patient is that uh, if you if you try to decipher the mechanism of injury, uh, what I suspected was that it was an abduction injury because uh, two is out and four and five is like a lateral column shortening type of injury. So one would suspect that there are a lot more ligamental instability involved in this case. So what's the plan? How do we know which metatarsal is unstable? Is it two and three? And then the cuboid was this an unrelated fracture, that means it's not related to, a, to the disc frame injury. Is it one, two, three? Two, three, four, five, not involving one or everything. And do we need to fix the cuboid? So these are some of the questions that, uh, that went through my mind when I uh, decided to bring him to the operating room. So I totally agree with the previous uh, cases, the previous presenter that the stress fields in the OR is very, very important. And uh, again, uh, with an abduction stress, uh, one could see that the first, second and third were all unstable. So therefore, my conclusion was that one, two, three, was uh, injury through the Liz Frank joint, pure ligamentous injury, and four and five uh, is a variant of a nutcracker type of injury, which is related to an abduction injury uh, across the mid foot, across the Liz Frank joint. So, uh, intraoperatively, this was the uh, my sequence of reduction. Uh, I pinned one back first, and then the second metatarsal to the medial pinniform, and these were and these were fixed with um, with uh, transfixation screws. Um, I normally for the first one uh, again back to the previous uh, issues that were raised. I normally do not like to fuse uh, a list frame injury primarily so i would try to fix it i could always do a fusion later if, if it fails uh, especially in younger patients so but for metatarsal for metatarsal for the first ray uh, i will usually use a transfixation screw but for the subsequent 
uh, Madam Pastor, usually I put the screws obliquely, so uh, M2 will go to C1 and uh, M3 will go to C2, so it doesn't really violate the uh, joint, the uh, C2M2 and C3M3 joint at all. So I try to do that to preserve as much uh, cartilage integrity as possible. So after fixing uh, 1 and 2, uh, 3, as you can see, C, uh, M3 to C2. Uh, and finally, uh, elevated that fragment, the articular fragment bone grafted the uh, effect under the subchondral bone and created the steel bone. So this was the uh, final outcome of this patient. Uh, and I removed the screws at three months. Okay, thank you very much. We can discuss that maybe later uh, with Alan's uh, moderation. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Dr. June. And uh, uh, we remain, uh, some of the questions uh, I, we'll leave it in the discussion as the uh, choices of fixation and uh, the approaches and also how you're going to stress those. What's the way you stress it? We will discuss later. And uh, next, our presenter is Dr. Shiri uh, from Shanghai, uh, Shanghai Six People's Hospital, one of the busiest trauma center I've ever seen. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Shi, it is uh, your turn. Okay, thanks uh, for a lot for Alan's invitation and uh, long time I'm to still, know. I'm still, in, I'm still in control, I'm still in control. How do I, okay. how do I give up control? Uh, let me see. Is it okay? It says I'm still in control. Go to the top of the screen yeah. on your left. And if you click on that, you'll give up control. A blue one or on the left. Which one? Right under where it says session one. Okay. okay. Session yeah, one, to... there's underneath that says take control. Okay, so Ming, you are now in control. Okay, okay. Now I can. Yeah. So uh thanks a lot, uh, my colleagues and uh, I don't miss from Shanghai Six People's Hospital. So we have a lot of cases of lysophagic injury, but uh, uh, which confused me is the, the how to uh, classify the the injuries for the low end or or or, or, or uh, other mechanism, and also what kind of the uh, uh, classification of the injury. So I have two cases. So can you show me? Yeah. This is a 30 years male. He's a uh, worker. He twisted his ankle, uh, uh, foot and complained the pain of his left uh, foot. And uh, he also have the eczemosis uh, under the uh, under foot. So for the... Sorry, 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 sorry. No. So, uh, for the x-rays, we just see a little uh, winding of uh, between the first metatarsal base and the second one. And the, the oblique view, uh, I think the left colon is okay. So we also have the way bearing view and the no dorsal dislocation. So we in China, we also always use the CT scan to, for the diagnosis because it is very really cheap. I don't know, maybe in the States it's very really expensive, but in the in China, it's 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 useful. So we we can see the on the column view we can see the uh, fractures of the base of the second metatarsal, and also the sagittal view we can see some problem with the media media cuneiform. So I think the the media colon and also the middle colon maybe it is uh, unstable. So, and this will, uh, we can see some widening also the flex sign uh, under the the media uh, letter letter of the media called a uh, media cuneiform. So, uh, under the opening room, uh, we can see this is a, a little. 
a lateral deviation of the foot. So also we do the uh, stress, uh, stress uh, test. We can see unstable of the middle colon, also the middle column. So this is this case have the obvious indication for the uh, surgery. So can we see the video? Maybe some problem. And also this is unstable for the on the base of the the middle colon. So we try to some uh, also argue with the fixation type for the percutaneous or the close. Uh, or open reduction. So, so this case, uh, I try to use the picnic fixation uh, uh, reduction, and uh, use the flexible fixation. So this is my plan. So use the uh, uh, reduction clamp, and uh, uh, fix use the uh, cushion uh, temporarily first, and uh, just check. The the the, the 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 gap between the first metatarsal and the second metatarsal, I think it's, it's okay. Then we use the your inner button. So according uh, there also some argument just for the direction or also the uh, of the, the fixation. So finally, we also add some uh, cushion line to fix the middle colon and also the uh, middle colon. There are also some problem. So this is a final uh, x-ray. We can see this is uh, stable yeah, between the, the second and the middle, uh, second and the first metatarsal. This is uh, the lateral view. And this is three months full up, so no pain, and also the middle arch, foot arch is okay. And uh, we remove the KYs by just three months. This is final letter view. So uh, we have uh, another kind of the, the uh, injury, it is more severely. This is a 30 years male, also is with a car accident and the crash of his uh, uh, right foot. We can see uh, almost the, the three colon also uh, were injured and uh, also dislocation, uh, lateral dislocation. And uh, the communication uh, uh, accumulated the fractures at the base uh, of the uh, middle column and also the stable in the middle column and also dislocation of the lateral column. So this is, we also use, we call this three column uh, classification. So for such kind of the injury, uh, we just worry about the soft tissue because this crash and uh, maybe some, a lot of problem, yeah. So we can see this uh, unstable, the very unstable also the scars, uh, because the, the, the patient was sent to me uh, just after one week uh, of the ex uh, accident. So there's some problem. So we just use uh, one to uh, first to a temporary fixes, fixed the, the bone for stabilize the soft tissues. We use the uh, uh, stage, the protocol. So then we use the uh, 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 fix the middle column, uh, use the KYs first to fit, uh, to stabilize the middle column. Then uh, middle column reduction, we use the check, uh, use uh, the hand, then, then uh, we also uh, uh, redux the, the second and the third metatarsal base, use my hand and the uh, KY temporarily fixed, then lateral column. So this we also use uh, three column uh, temporarily fixed and uh, 
we want to stabilize the soft tissue. This is the final uh, x-rays. We should uh, uh, a little, still a little lateral deviation of the forefoot, so still unstable the media column. So we call the, and uh, the lateral view is, is the dose of dislocation have deduced, reduced, and uh, after two weeks, uh, the soft tissue is uh, it's okay. They will use uh, want to do the deployment first for the scars, and uh, we use the two approaches because we think the media color is really unstable. We use the media in approach, and we find that this is uh, uh, fractures at the base of the first metatarsal base and also media cuneiform, and uh, we can see, we use a distraction, and they find the fragments on the base of the uh, plant base of the first metatarsal base, then, then we fuse it uh, and use the plant plate, and also uh, use the second approach, dorsal approach, use a uh, uh, bridge plating for the uh, second uh, metatarsal. So this is a final view of the x-rays. Six weeks, it's still swollen, but the foot arch is, is uh, looks good. And uh, we take the, the temporary KYs at the six weeks. This is uh, half a year follow up, so no pain. The foot uh, shape is good. And this is uh, one year late, he wants to remove his uh, plates. So this is the finally uh, six weeks, weeks follow up after the plating removal. So uh, for my uh, for my uh, consideration for the uh, for the risk factor injuries, the most important is for diagnosis for the injury type. And second one is for just the uh, the fracture. Uh, 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 injury type for the three column. We use the three column. All right. So we probably due to the connection is like a kind of a uh, lost of the last slide. But uh, uh, thanks a lot for uh, uh, the excellent cases. I uh, also noticed some interesting cultural differences and patient uh, from uh, Asia is probably, I'm not sure from Singapore is the same thing. They want their hardware to be removed, even if it's a fusion cases. And that's uh, like another major surgery sometimes. You know, that's quite interesting. And uh, last but least, and we have uh, uh, Dr. Yoon, uh, have, uh, the floor is yours. And uh, let's see uh, your uh, cases uh, to uh, show us. Okay, well, um, hopefully everyone is seeing these slides here. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, Dr. Yan, and uh, I learned a lot from hearing the cases from uh, my co-panelists here. Um, uh, please feel free to interrupt or ask questions in the chat if you have questions or if I, um, if you can't hear me or if there's any other problems. So uh, yeah, as Dr. Yan said, I'm Pat Yoon, I'm from, um, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, I wanted to go through my basic philosophy in uh, classifying and um, um, figure out where to put what screws and how to just generally treat these types of injuries. Um, this is a, a first uh, case here. I have a couple of low energy and a couple of high energy cases. Uh, you can see that there's a fracture in the medial cuneiform. If you look carefully at the lateral view, you can see that the fracture line is extending more or less horizontally through the middle of the cuneiform. So my philosophy is to try and figure out what's displaced compared with the rest of the foot. And that uh, simplifies it in, in, in my mind, it makes it easier for me. So everything circled there in yellow 
is separated from the rest of the foot. We got a CT scan here showing that the top half or the dorsal half of the cuneiform is separated and that went with the first metatarsal. So essentially everything in yellow was displaced. And to fix this fracture, um, people always ask, well, how do you put screws where and which screws do you do first? Well, the way I think about it is just fix anything yellow to anything gray and that will fix this injury. So um, basically something more along the lines of this, but it doesn't have to be these exact screws. Anything from yellow to anything gray um, will, will stabilize this injury. Of course, some are better than others, but um, anything will do something to stabilize this. So that's what we did in this case here. Um, you can see one screw going from dorsal to plantar in the medial cuneiform to basically um, sandwich those two pieces together. Um, so um, this is him after a few weeks. Uh, case number two, here's another example here. You go, okay, there are fractures through the second and third metatarsal bases, right? But you can look at the cubo metatarsal joints and numbers four and five are also separated. So basically, um, what you have in this case here is where everything um, on the second, three, fourth rays is separate from the rest of the foot. So everything circled in yellow is separate. So how do you fix this? Well, basically anything that connects yellow to gray is going to fix this fracture. Uh, and that's just my basic philosophy for uh, approaching these types of injuries. So it doesn't have to be a pattern like this. Uh, certainly you could argue that that oblique screw going from the third metatarsal to the middle cuneiform is uh, is is unique, um, but anything that stabilizes yellow to gray will stabilize this injury, and she was able to return to running afterwards. Uh, next case here. So this is an injury that um, has a little bit of an unusual pattern. Uh, it is very similar to the injury we saw before where the first metatarsal was off, but there's so many variations in terms of what can be fractured off with the first metatarsal. Uh, so in that case, the previous one, the first metatarsal was connected to a part of the cuneiform, but it can take part of the navicular with it, uh, as in this case here. So this was referred to us as an quote unquote isolated navicular fracture. But of course, as you can all probably see, there's something else going on here. You can see the uh, Lisfranc frank joint is wide and the uh, medial to intermediate cuneiform joint is wide as well. So what this represents here, if you recognize this pattern, is that the whole medial column, including the navicular, uh, is separate. So everything yellow is separate from the rest of the foot. Uh, so basically, in this case here, if you connect yellow to gray, that will stabilize this injury. Of course, certain screws, of course, are going to be better than others, but yellow to gray fixation will stabilize this fracture. And so what we did was um, stabilize yellow to gray. You could argue that you could have just done it with screws and not a plate, and I would uh, I would not uh, dispute that, um, but that's what we did. Um, as a side note, if you have a very strong suspicion that hardware will eventually come out, uh, it's much, much easier to remove screws if every screw you put is through a plate, um, rather than hunt and peck for individual screws using fluoroscopy. Um, so that's one benefit of putting every screw you put in through a plate if if possible. And this is him after his hardware was, uh, was removed. Um, another example here of an interesting case. Um, in this case here, you can see the list frank joint is wide, uh, the second, third, and you can look carefully at four and five and see if those are off or not, but certainly second and third are off. And you can look carefully and see basically the first is off too. So it's not just second, third, and fourth, but that little subtle widening of the first TMT joint um, is suggestive of what we call a homolateral injury where all five rays go off together. And um, I would say this is a relatively unusual pattern, but this does happen sometimes. And so the key here is to recognize that not just two and three are off, but one is off with and came in the same direction with it. Uh, in other words, laterally. So anything yellow to anything gray will fix this injury too. And that's what we did. So we went screws through the first, second, and third TMT joints and across the frank joint, um, and then typically do K wires for the lateral uh, lateral columns. Now, this is a very interesting case as well too, and highlights a little bit issue of, uh, of surgical timing. 
I am 100% with you that if your plan is to fuse these anyway, it doesn't really matter if you fuse them early uh, or late. So it takes away a lot of the, um, the, the urgency of timing for these. Uh, but if you're going to fix it, um, then I think it certainly makes uh, it a lot easier to fix it earlier if you're going to fix it. So in this case here, um, you can see that there's clear disruption of all five TMT joints. But instead of all five going off in the same direction like the previous case, ray one went one way and rays two through five went the other way. So this would be a divergent injury. And you can see that that middle cuneiform really kind of drives as a wedge in between um, the medial column and the lateral columns. So essentially those are one unit, this is a unit and those two units separated from the rest of the foot. And so basically you wanna fix anything white to anything gray uh, and bring those two white groups together. And this is a little cartoon uh, for the residents showing what we're planning to do in surgery. Um, now, in terms of uh, um, the eventual fixation, this is what we would like to do, connect uh, white to gray. Um, but what if the skin is super, super swollen and you can't fix it right away? Um, what I've oftentimes seen referred into clinic is patients that are a week or two out with gross displacement of joints and then a beginnings of skin necrosis or in some cases, rarely, uh, even bone poking through the skin. So if something is grossly dislocated, then waiting out too long can, can cause skin problems. So what we've adopted here is very similar to what um, Dr. Shu's last case showed, which was temporary fixation with K-wires um, and then stage fixation, um, stage um, incisions later on. So it's exactly the same type of situ situation um, as Dr. Shu's last case. So you can see here, temporary K-wire fixation, um, we try to put our incision or K wires as far away from our planned incisions as possible. Um, this one here going down the, the second tarsal and tarsal joint is entering the skin as far distally as possible to try and avoid uh, our open incision plan. And uh, the other screws, or the other pins go through the medial and lateral parts of the foot. And it makes later fixation so much easier if the joints are already reduced as opposed to having to reduce them uh, weeks later on. Um, I take my screws out at six months, which I think uh, gives less chance for redisplacement um, or recurrent displacement, but um, admittedly it does uh, cause some patients to break those screws, as in this case here. I warn them about it ahead of time. The heads can be easily removed, uh, and usually the, the embedded shafts of the screws that can't be removed, usually those are not the symptomatic parts of the screws. So. Um, do, are running out of time here, so I'll just show one last case here. Um, I had some low energy injuries and I did want to show one high energy injury uh, as I was asked to do. This is a young gentleman, an engineer, uh, healthy, um, that was, uh, his foot was run over by his father-in-law. Um, he says it was an accident, but I'm not 100% sure it was an accident. Um, but at any rate, it was an open injury with a large skin declubbing injury. Uh, my partner who was on call uh, treated initially with a debridement and, and this is what I uh, inherited with uh, open skin as you can see here in a large uh, area of skin loss. Uh, as you can see here, he put some pins in to temporarily stabilize it. Um, so what I did is I did another thorough, another thorough debris mount and put a cement antibiotic spacer in um, into the gap left from the base of the first metatarsal and the medial cuneiform, which were debrided. Um, and put uh, some percutaneous screw fixation in um, for the rest of the foot. And then what I did was I didn't want to put in um, immediate bone graft into this large contaminated open wound bed you know, with gravel and tire in it. Uh, so we closed it up and put sub-atmospheric wound uh, dressings on until a good granulation layer occurred. And then we skin grafted it. And then we waited uh, until the skin matured. And then later on, I went through a dorsal incision outside the area of the skin graft um, and put in large structural uh, uh, autographs from his uh, iliac crest. Um, you can tell this case is a few years old because I haven't used iliac crest in a few years. Um, and then packed them in place and did a, a delayed primary arthrodesis um, with um, with small little compression plates, as you can see here, that uh, they compress the joints nicely. They go from, as you can see, straight to bent, and that does a nice compression. I'm sure um, many of you have probably used these uh, devices, uh, I'm sure. Um, we did get uh, good alignment and you can see here that darker area in the base of the first metatarsal and the medial cuneiform uh, is an area of um, is a autogenous bone graft. And this is him uh, one year post-op with uh, fully fused joints. And uh, 
good skin condition and reasonable uh, range of motion as you can see here. So with that, I will cede control back to our moderator, Dr. Yan, and uh, go ahead and take it, Ellen. Yeah, thanks, thanks Patrick. Th those are impressive cases, awesome. And uh, I, every time I see your cases, like you make difficult things, it seems to be a little bit easier, you know, that's, I love your approaches. Okay, so we have uh, uh, only a little bit of time and uh, uh, for our discussion. So I wanna hit on a couple of uh, uh, topics that I usually have a little bit, uh, uh, you know, I still need time to consider. So first is let's uh, uh, talk about diagnosis of list ranks. Those obvious cases, there is a lot of problems. So what about those cases are really subtle, like Steve, you're taking into the OR. So what kind of a diagnostic modality? And let me ask you a so detailed question. We're using plain films. We're using weight bearing stress. What if the patient cannot weight bear? What are you going to do? You are, when you're going to stress it, how the detail you stress it? And uh, does anybody use weight bearing CT at this point? And uh, when would you use the MRI? What are you looking for? So it's kind of a loaded question, but uh, it's uh, uh, surrounding the diagnosis. And Steve, I would uh, pick your brain. What do you do? Uh, what, what do you usually do? So, you know, it's interesting. I, um, like Patrick, I have low energy and I have the high energy. But high energy are easy to diagnose in, in isolated injuries. Where they give you the problem is in the polytraumatized patient in the ICU. That's why they're missed so frequently. But when you get someone who walks into your clinic on crutches and they said, you know, a few days ago, I rolled my foot, I fell, or I, I don't know what happened. I was drunk and I was in high heels. And you look at them and they may have some swelling. Maybe they have some ecchymoses. You think they have a list frank, but they can't put all their weight on their foot. I really look at that person and say, you know what? I will probably be fusing you because I am a believer in, in primary fusions in most people. Uh, again, the young athletes, I don't, but I'll say, come back next week. Let me get weight-bearing x-rays, and I always get bilateral weight-bearing x-rays so I can look for subtlety. I do not have weight-bearing CT scanners, so I do not get CTs that often. The way I look at CT is more for pre-op planning. So I get an injury that comes in, and I see multiple joints that are out of place. I get my CT to help me understand what I'm going to do at surgery. So I depend on weight-bearing x-rays very rarely. That Stress x-ray was probably 10 years ago. I bet you that's the last stress x-ray I've done. Uh, but in that setting, in, in someone I need an answer very quickly, like an athlete, it's helpful. Uh, MRI, I get a lot of people sent to me who have already had an MRI. And the problem with MRIs is interesting. I think Steve Rakin may have published a study a number of years ago looking at MRI and said, if you have a complete tear of your second, you know, your list frank ligament from the base of M2, uh, into the medial cuneiform, you have about a 90% chance that you have complete instability. And my numbers may be off a little bit, but the problem is you don't often see a very clear, complete tear of the second uh, of Liz Frank's ligament. And so then you have an MRI that is very misleading. And some people will say, well, the radiologist read you have a Liz Frank injury and you need surgery. And then I say, why don't we get you standing and we'll get a weight bearing x-ray. And if your x-ray is completely benign, and you're putting 100% of your weight on in single leg stance, we're gonna treat you conservatively. And so I think MRI clouds the picture. I try not to order it. I know that's a long answer, but you gave me a long question. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, uh, th thanks to Steve. So, so uh, yeah, Reiki, hey. Steve Reiki has that. Uh, uh, I think that's uh, probably only one of the very few uh, papers on MRIs to talk about a plantar. If you look yeah. at a plantar ligament portion, I have uh, no problem if uh, the patient are dorsal caps or dorsal part. I, usually that does not uh, have much of a trouble. What about, uh, you know, interosseous, the middle portion, you know, so that's, uh, uh, well, does not give any, uh, like, a real good evidence-based, uh, 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 so far, as good as it is. Now, uh, some paper has mentioned your know, flamingo view, you use, a, like, single leg standing. So I, I, I feel it's a little bit cumbersome to do it. I feel that the most, most accurate is probably you stress it in an OR, but, you know, it's uh, kind of like it's harder to convince people all going to the OR, like the cases you have, that's a good catch for that athletes that you get uh, going to the OR. So uh, when would you decide, you know, this patient, I need to go to the OR just to do it and consent for everything. And when uh, uh, is not uh, that a case? 
you know, again, I think that probably wasn't my last time I took someone to the OR. I, I had maybe one or two other athletes over the years, but you see where I'm going with this. It's people who want an answer immediately. You need an answer for some reason, and you can't come back in a week or two weeks or three weeks to get weight-bearing x-rays, I'll take you to the OR. I, I don't think it's reliable to do stress imaging in the office. So there are there are right. times when I will take them. But you're right. Trying to convince someone when they have a $6,000 or $12,000 deductible that I'm going to take you to the OR to stress you, and I may wake you up and may do nothing, not easy to do. So <laughs> unfortunately, money comes into it as well. And people don't want to go under anesthesia. And so I think if you're not a big believer in, in primary fusions and you want to fix people, I agree with one of the other speakers who said, you want to get some of these earlier than later if you have to fix them. Otherwise, it's very hard. So if you're a fixer, I would be doing a lot more stress imaging in the OR. Okay, uh, we have a question from the crowd. Somebody's asked, do you make any decision changes in terms of fusion versus ORIF in the diabetic patient? Or does a diabetic patient affect your treatment decision, especially if it's uncontrolled? Yeah, diabetes, I'm fusing everyone, and I'll fuse all five people if they're neuropathic. I think if they're uncontrolled diabetics, like hemoglobin A1C is 14, and I have a fairly stable midfoot that I can hold off on, I'm not operating on them until those numbers are better. But sometimes you have to admit them to the hospital and get them aggressively treated to get their glucose under control. And you're not going to operate based on a hemoglobin A1C. You'll operate based upon you know, where their numbers are over a, a short, shorter period of time. All right. Okay. So uh, uh, just in order for completeness, uh, Dr. Nunley had a, a paper on bone scan for athletic uh, injuries. I, I guess like uh, that paper is a little bit, uh, you know, uh, earlier. Uh, I, I have not heard anyone using bone scans uh, for those difficult diagnoses. So if, uh, you know, our panels has uh, some other uh, opinions, uh, you know, uh, please voice here. Um, I can move to the uh, second, you know, questions that we, uh, I think it is interesting, is uh, we have uh, mentioned about timing of the surgery, the urgency of it, and Dr. Yoon's cases has illustrated that loud. Uh, uh, let me ask you one question. What if the patient has a compartment syndrome? What, what do you do for the uh, foot cases? Do you open it or do you close it? And there are evidence of it, uh, what to do? Yeah, just briefly, unfortunately, compartment syndrome in the foot is one of the things that oftentimes comes to us late uh, because foot and ankle injuries are very commonly referred in um, as uh, from the primary team as uh, being um, perceived as not as, as urgent. So by the time many cases of compartment syndrome are seen by the foot and ankle orthopedist, they're oftentimes past a six to eight hour window. And when you get to it chronically, at that point, it becomes more dangerous to open it up. That being said, uh, on the few cases where I have seen compartment syndrome and it's been there and we've gotten to the patient right away. Um, we discuss it with them and uh, I generally will lean towards recommending um, the, the full nine compartment releases um, with, uh, with, uh, with three incisions, medial and then two dorsal. Um, but it is a pretty morbid uh, thing to do to the patient as well. So it's just one of those things that requires discussion about the pros and cons. All right. Uh, now, the approaches, Steve had mentioned the approach or the midline approaches. So uh, very interesting, I asked our two panel members from Asia. So, you know, the size of the patients are different. You're looking at an Asia patient, especially female patient, the size of their foot, you look at their size of the foot, you have two incisions and we stipulated that uh, from a trauma principle, you have five centimeters apart. If you put five, five centimeters apart between those two incisions, you're like, uh, you're leaving the most important things right in between. I feel it's like very difficult to, difficult to get to where you want to do. So uh, how many of you guys are still two incision approaches versus one? I have started using one also, a little bit different from Steve's. I uh, centered right over the second metatarsal all the way as long as I can from the uh, uh, MTP joint to TMT. I can get it easily to all three columns in one, two, and three without uh, much of a problem. Unless I need to do another thing in the uh, uh, lateral columns, I probably leaning towards a little bit of medial and then with the two incisions. What's uh, our uh, opinion here? 
So, Alan, just real quick, my incision was over the second metatarsal as well. It wasn't central. Oh, okay. That slide looked like it. That gets me to one, two, and three. I use two incisions if I need to reduce, open, reduce four and five. Yeah. Oh, I so, think, um, go, go ahead, go ahead. You first. Okay, I, I think I think um, the two incision and five centimeters uh, criteria wasn't really based on science. So uh, I think it's a good guideline, but uh, to me, uh, it, it doesn't really matter if it's a bit narrower than five centimeters because I think it is the rate, it is the ratio between the length of the incision and the the, the skin bridge that really matters. That, that's number one. So it doesn't really bother me too much. Second point is, uh, if I be, I be, it is, I make the incision depending on which column I want. I feel that uh, it, it should be fixed. So for example, if the lateral column need not be fixed and only one, two, and three need to be fixed, then I often make an, in, a medial incision for one and then for two and three, I make a dorsal incision over two and three. So it does not follow the conventional uh, first west phase and, and pop, uh, uh, pop ray kind of uh, alignment. Uh, so I still use more than one incision often. I prefer a more direct approach than peeling off soft tissue. Uh, go ahead, uh, soft tissue. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dr. Chun. We are running uh, out of time, so we, had a great discussion tonight. Again, I learned a lot from my uh, uh, panels. Thank you very much for uh, uh, this session and uh, give it back to Dr. Parak. Thank you, everybody. Fantastic session. Thank you.